Episode of Trans Regret Snoopy Presents the Bible. I wanted to talk about Philippians 2. This is a chapter in a fairly short letter from Paul and Timothy, but it is extremely pithy and there is a lot of substance, a lot to work with, and some very complicated moments that I think are worth sussing out. I think I have more Bibles in front of me, more different translations in front of me right now than I may ever have had for an episode, and uh, especially one that I'm doing by myself. But the complexity of this passage, uh, especially the first sort of portion of chapter 2 in Philippians, I think requires the um, consulting of a few different points of view and a few different translations. I found that some of the more common translations, some of the ones that certain denominations or certain groups seem to lean on more heavily, maybe aren't necessarily as satisfying or don't um, elaborate in places that they need to for particular elements of this. So um, as vague as that may sound from the beginning, bear with me, and let's dive into Philippians 2. I wanted to just give a brief introduction um, from the theme portion at the beginning of the um, letter to the Corinthians from J.B. Phillips, uh, New Testament in Modern English. It says, The purpose of this letter is to acknowledge a gift sent to Paul in prison by Epaphroditus from the Christians at Philippi. Possibly this letter was delayed by the serious illness of Epaphroditus while with Paul, and Paul is evidently by now himself expecting early release from prison. Except possibly for the letter to Philemon, this is the most personal example of Paul's correspondence, and he is obviously very fond of the young church at Philippi. It expresses his high hopes for their unity, faithfulness, and progress in the faith. It also contains a warning, like that in the letter to the Galatians, against false teachers who wanted to bring these inexperienced Christians under the Jewish law. So that's a little bit of context for what we might be seeing, obviously, Um, All of Paul's letters are so early in the church that um, a lot of folks were having trouble sort of creating a concrete version of what uh, what their practice would look like or what their beliefs would be or should be, or in this case, I think, can be. Um, Paul does a really good job of stretching out the idea of the Christ, stretching out the idea of Jesus' sacrifice. And, uh, and also throw some, um, some really interesting challenges to this young group of believers that um, may not be first in their mind for how they think they ought to behave in the world. The primary translation that I'm going to be reading from today is going to be the New Revised Standard. Um, I just think that it does a, a better job than some others with the language here, although, I, like I said earlier, I'm going to be jumping from place to place quite a bit. Chapter 2 opens with, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. We'll pause there. Only two verses in, I know the beginning of this sounds kind of odd. It sounds like like he's questioning whether or not there is encouragement in Christ or any consolation in love. But one interpretation that I heard someone say of this, so they said it a little bit better than I think I could have come up with myself, is not if, but because. Because there is encouragement in Christ. Because there is consolation from love. Uh, It's not a sarcastic, but it's like a rhetorical if. Rather than, um, rather than an actual questioning of this. Jumping back in at verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, 
but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We'll pause here because the format changes after verse 5. And I find this very interesting. I think a lot of people, when they consider the early church, um, they were um, acquainted a great deal with the early scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, but that was really all of the scripture that they had to deal with. Obviously, the Gospels, um, the epistles, the letters were going to specific places, to specific churches. The Gospels hadn't really been um, circulated in the way that we know them now. There wasn't a Bible for these young Christians. They were only to, um, they had this sort of oral tradition, which would have been normal for them, uh, especially those that had a Jewish background. And Paul takes the moment here to split from his prose, his sort of conversational tone, and we see both in um, the NRSV and in some other translations a break into what looks to be a kind of verse. Uh, what we know about this type of verse or what, what's being said here is that it's actually a quotation from an early Christian song or, or psalm, something that the people would have known as like a quotation from something that they sang together. It wasn't that uh, people had no idea what to think of Jesus. They had a lot of ideas and obviously took centuries and centuries and centuries to figure out uh, what perhaps the right or wrong ideas might be, though I think our interpretation of what is the right and wrong ideas of Jesus uh, should still be considered, should still be questioned. But here he breaks into a kind of a song at verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a lot to think about here. The first thing that came to mind when I was reading this in my New King James was um, they had a completely different word at the end of verse 6. The New King James says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You notice the word robbery there. Robbery is such an odd turn of phrase to us. I think in our minds in the modern world, the word robbery has extremely negative connotations and um, involves a kind of crime. Well, robbery is actually a more accurate translation of the word that was in the Greek there. So the New King James and the King James translators weren't wrong when they used the word robbery. The problem is, in our context today, we don't hear that thing the same way. And I think it does more to confuse people when they see the word robbery in this context than it does to help them understand. The word robbery in this case is... Uh, like a prize, something that's been taken and something that's being held onto, rather than um, spoils of a crime. I had to look this up quite a bit because I was really, really interested in why it would be that they use this word robbery. And it turns out it is just a case where the way they spoke at this time and the Greek word that they wrote down was simply that. It's been... Um, quite a debate, actually, uh, whether or not this phrase is to mean Jesus did not consider it something attainable to be one with God or to be on the same level as God, or if this means 
Jesus did not consider it something that should be exploited to be on the same level as God. I've even heard some say that their interpretation of it is that Jesus did not consider it wrong that he should be on the same level as God. Obviously, all three of these things mean very different things when, uh, when in the context of this verse. Not that anyone asked, but the way that I read this, I see it more in, in, the, in line with the way the NRSV is saying it. Um, the ESV is also an interesting take on this because I think that the ESV, uh, the NIV, all kind of um, try to simplify this, this phrasing. And in a way, it, it's more helpful. It, it helps to um, be a little simpler to understand. But it also, I think, maybe oversimplifies what, um, what's being said here and turns it into a possible sort of a negative clause. So I'll read 5, 6, and 7 in the ESV. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The ESV makes a note in the um, footnotes there that says, or a thing to be held onto for advantage. A thing to be held onto for advantage or a thing to be exploited. The crucial element here is what follows, and that is the humbling of oneself, the humility, bringing oneself down from an exalted place. Jesus was equal with God, so Jesus did not find it necessary to use his equality with God to lord it over people during his time on earth. He saw his mission, essentially, during his time as a human being, not to reign supreme and to show off all of his powers and to, to tell everybody how great he was. Instead, he put himself into the position of a lowly person, someone who was humbled, someone who was gracious, someone who didn't just uh, rule over as Lord, not because he didn't have the right to, but because what he was there to do was not to simply be God on earth in human form and rule over people, but to be human as God in human form, and to live as a person. And obviously the experience that Jesus had was one that many humans never experienced. Most humans would never experience something so awful, something so torturous, as being whipped and beaten and crucified. The use of slave in the NRSV, the use of slave in the New King James, stuck out to me. That's in verse 7. There is um, a really wonderful podcast called The Word on Fire, and anytime I recommend a podcast or uh, recommend like a church's sermon, I want to make it clear that I don't endorse their theology, that I don't necessarily ascribe to everything that they're preaching, but if it's of interest to me, it may be of interest to you. So um, this is a Catholic uh, podcast. And they're doing a series about sort of modern thinkers or thinkers, philosophers, writers that have changed the modern mindset. This particular episode was about Friedrich Nietzsche and his contention with Christianity. Nietzsche was born into a Christian family, was actually the son, I believe, of a Lutheran uh, minister. And as his intellect developed as he began to become a writer. Um, as his life went on, he grew more and more resentful of Christianity. One of his major gripes with Christianity was what he called slave morality. Um, while he thought the power of humanity, the philosophical, mental, power that we have, the self-awareness that we have as humans, was something that we should glorify and honor. He saw the Christian mindset, the Christian message, as one that taught its people to be lowly, um, not to embrace power, but to forsake it. 
it's obviously a lot more complicated than that. I won't pretend to know everything about him. I've read a little bit of his work. But the clearest indication of this is the name of Nietzsche's autobiography. It's called Eke Homo, um, which means Behold the Man. The use of this in the context of his autobiography is to elevate his humanity, elevate his intellect, tell his story, but not to, um, not to use this phrase in the way that we see it being spoken by Pontius Pilate. Uh, this is from John 19, verse 5. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. The Greek in John 19 here uses the exact same phrase that Nietzsche used to uh, name his autobiography. I don't think that's a mistake. Could have been a coincidence. But uh, a lot of modern mindset, a lot of our modern philosophy, uh, a lot of the way that we form our opinion of ourselves, our opinion of our culture, is about power. It's about status. It's about establishing oneself and, and proving one's own validity, proving one's own power, proving um, how important one is as an individual. And it doesn't take a lot to hear this, to notice this, and then to see it in direct contrast with how we see Jesus act in the Gospels and how we see Paul write about Jesus in the epistles. James did the same thing. Really, all of the writers of the New Testament had this mindset of humility, of lowliness. So if the slave morality is one that leads one to sacrifice oneself, to lower oneself, of course the modern mindset takes issue with this. It's not difficult to see why it is that people in our modern day feel the need to assert themselves as valid and important and to show their value. We live in a world that uh, makes us feel more and more insignificant as days go on, as we get older. Different factors in our lives from work to media to family, any number of factors can um, at times make us feel less than. There's any number of, of ways that we see this play out. Christianity is at odds with this idea that it is necessary for us to continue to prove our importance. It's desirable, actually, to humble oneself in the way that Jesus did. If God, in the form of man, can lower himself on earth, not just lower himself to become man, but once in the form of man, humble himself even further, below really any stature of man on earth, then who are we as just people to say that we need to elevate ourselves? It's important, too, that in verses 9 through 11, we see what God does when Jesus humbles himself. God says, you have lowered yourself, you have sacrificed yourself to the point of death, even death on a cross. So therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Someone might read this and go, well, wait a second. God didn't give Jesus the name of Jesus after he humbled himself, after he died. Well, I think it, it's an important detail to point out that the way we say Jesus's name isn't really even the way that Jesus's name was pronounced during the time that he was alive here with man on earth. It's something closer to like Yeshua. Why we landed on Jesus is probably a story for another time in another episode. So I don't think that the point being made here is that the name Jesus or the name Yeshua is necessarily the name that is exalted above every name. I think what's being said here is that in the way that the Bible uses a name as sort of a crowning, like making one royalty, Jesus is given the name that's above every name in that he is made Lord. Uh, he is exalted higher and higher. I heard a very confusing uh, sermon from John MacArthur about this. 
who was trying to explain that Jesus was one with God, and so, you know, as exalted as one can be, and then lowered himself on earth, then was exalted even higher than he was before, and wasn't that a great thing? And while I appreciate the sentiment, I think that that does more to confuse than it does to help. Jesus is Lord. Jesus was Lord. Jesus is one with God. So I don't think that it's necessary to say that it is a name that Jesus has given that now makes him even higher than he was before, but simply that he is brought up to the heavens. He is brought up as king and is the Lord of the kingdom of God. It's very true. When it says every knee should bend in heaven and on earth, I think this is more of a reference to in heaven and in the kingdom of God, all that are not God worship God, not that now somehow God the Father bends his knee to God the Son in Jesus. I did say this was going to be confusing. I'd like to flip over to David Bentley Hart's New Testament. He uh, has some very exhaustive footnotes that I think are really helpful. And so I'm going to jump from what we just read down into his footnotes here. We will start again at verse 5. Be of that mind in yourselves that was also in the anointed one Jesus, who subsisting in God's form did not deem being on equal terms with God a thing to be grasped. Here's the footnote. A word that typically means something seized or stolen plunder, but that also may have uh, much the same connotation here as a windfall or perhaps a prize, or perhaps it should be read as something to be clung to or held on to, a prize Christ might have jealously kept to himself, but which instead he relinquished in emptying or impoverishing himself for us. He emptied himself and divested himself. I think that early Christians were living in a time where the Jewish law was um, very specific about what things one could and could not do, what things one could and could not come into contact with. And in that way, these sort of legalistic ways they were led to believe that it was simply a matter of doing the right things, saying the right things, staying away from the right things, and that was all it took to be holy, to be sanctified. And this new idea through the sacrifice of Jesus, this new idea through the forgiveness provided in Christ, is that it is not simply a matter of checking boxes. It is much more about changing one's posture of themselves in the world. It's really, really hard to do. Most days when I wake up, my first thought isn't, okay, how can I, how can I lower myself today? How can I make myself less? Actually, I would think that psychologically, that might have an effect on us after a while. One of my favorite devotional books um, is by Dane Ortland. It's called Gentle and Lowly. I've talked about it on the show before. And there is a chapter called His Very Heart that has a little portion that popped out in my mind when I was reading through Philippians 2 in preparation for this episode. It says, We project onto Jesus our skewed instincts about how the world works. Human nature dictates that the wealthier person, the more they tend to look down on the poor. The more beautiful a person the more they are put off by the ugly. And without realizing what we're doing, we quietly assume that one so high and exalted has corresponding difficulty drawing near to the despicable and the unclean. Sure, Jesus comes close to us, we agree, but he holds his nose. This risen Christ is, after all, the one whom God has highly exalted at whose name every knee will one day bow in submission. This is the one whose eyes are like a flame of fire, and whose voice is like the roar of many waters, and who has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, and whose face is like the sun shining in full strength. In other words, this is one so unspeakably brilliant that his resplendence cannot adequately be captured with words so ineffably magnificent that all language dies away before his splendor. It's difficult in our minds to imagine a God that would humble himself in this way. It's also difficult, I think, in the context of the New Testament when you read certain portions, certain people's interpretations 
of of Jesus's teachings. Uh, maybe when you read Revelation, <laughs> to see Jesus as someone who is lowly, as someone who was uh, nothing but self-effacing and self-sacrificing. It's also hard for us, I think, in a in a instinctual religious way, to imagine God as lower than us. Of course, it's not exactly that simple, but it is really the nature of Christ's likeness to give oneself over. It's the nature of Jesus to bring oneself down. Even Jesus says, I will be brought up. Of course, he was referring to being crucified. Another translation that N.T. Wright, Kingdom New Testament, says it this way. This is how you should think among yourselves with the mind that you have because you belong to the Messiah. Jesus, who though in God's form did not regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit, instead he emptied himself and received the form of a slave. Being born in the likeness of humans and then having human appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death, yes, even death of the cross. And so God has greatly exalted him, and to him in his favor has given the name which is over all names, that now at the name of Jesus every knee within heaven shall bow, on earth too, and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus, Messiah, is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And he right breaks the language out into verse as well. I think it's easy to read Paul and to imagine him as stuffy. It's easy to read him and imagine everything as a sort of a complex web of theological arguments and uh, Christology that is um, punishingly complicated uh, in, in its way that it, that it played out at his time. But really all Paul was trying to do was trying to give early believers a solid sense of a giving and loving God of a self-sacrificing God. I really just love what Paul does with this passage. I pray every day that I can find a way to find that same love in my heart for other people that Jesus had for us. Every day I try to remind myself in my prayer, in my everyday life, at, at my job or among friends, that it shouldn't be my mission to show what good I can do. It shouldn't be my mission to show how good I am, what I know, and how much better I am than others. We know there are a lot of people during Jesus' time that made a career out of that. I try to remind myself to humble myself before God and before others. If Christ is the iteration of God in man, and Christ is with us, the Holy Spirit moves in the earth, and God is still present, then God is within all of us. So the way I treat someone driving down the highway, waiting in line at a coffee shop, being shouted down at work, the way I treat people is a reflection of how I treat God. Jesus said this very same thing, what you did to the least of uh, those uh, on earth, you did to me. It's no mystery that Jesus saw himself in every lowly person on earth. This is the company that Jesus kept while he was here. If Jesus came to earth, if Jesus was born into a family of significance, uh, into a royal family, uh, instead of just being in the bloodline of David, rather, um, you know, being born to a king, I think our opinion of what we should do and how we should behave would be very, very different. But Jesus was born to a, a family that had little to nothing. Jesus was born into poverty. Jesus was born into a humble beginning, and as such, began his ministry in humility that's hard enough for us to do. Imagine how hard that must have been for God to do. I mentioned earlier the name of Jesus, or Yeshua, uh, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing too, 
you know, the way we exalt the name Jesus as opposed to Christ is, is misguided. I'll stand by that, but I think it's important that also the name Yeshua was one that, uh, that meant deliverer or savior. So it's not that the, the name had no meaning at all, but it's that that name in particular could have been anything. It was what the name stood for that was important. I'm going to read a little bit further, and then I'll close this episode out. I'll start back in, in the NRSV at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who has at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This phrase, fear and trembling, is also very easily misunderstood and misconstrued. I think that a surface reading of this passage, of this verse, and the verse that follows, could be very easily interpreted as, you must be terrified for your salvation at all times. You must worry with every step that you take that you will somehow screw up your opportunity to be in the family of God and to live in the kingdom of God and to have the eternal life that Jesus promised. I really sincerely don't think that's what's being said here. This idea of fear and trembling isn't to say in our attempts to make ourselves smaller, in our attempts to become more humble and to lower ourselves, we should take this task of what we have to do on earth, um, not individual tasks, but our, our meaning in life to love one another, to give to one another, to be present for one another, should be taken very seriously. The fear and the trembling is not uh, being terrified. The fear and the trembling is keeping a steady hand while you're operating on something. Um, it's not about being afraid for your life or for your soul, um, but it is understanding that at the core of our belief is something very serious. At the core of our soul is the potential for eternity. And in that way, we should treat our goal of humility, we should treat our goal of loving each other with, with, a, with a very serious, dire, intense emotion. Instead of a poem, I wanted to uh, read a, a bit of a chapter from The Imitation of Christ. Uh, there's no way I'll ever get sick of this book, so if, uh, if you're bored with it, my apologies. If you haven't read it, please do. This is from the chapter that we ought to forsake ourselves and follow Christ by bearing his cross. This book kind of switches back and forth between directives, guidance, and, um, and prayer. And this section is some prayer. O oh Lord Jesus, inasmuch as your way is narrow and straight and is, as well, much despised by the world, give me grace gladly to bear the contempt of the world. There is no servant greater than his Lord, and no disciple who is above his master. Let your servant, therefore, be exercised in your ways, for in them is the health and the very perfection of life. Whatever I read or hear beside that way does not refresh me or fully delight me. Thanks, everybody. Bring me your weak, your weary. Bring me your strange and cold. 